So, uh, welcome to the second lecture in uh, this Introduction to Software Technology course. Today we're going to continue where we uh, were last time. Uh, today with a focus on software processes. Uh, so, when we develop software there are many activities we need to go through and uh, how we organize these uh, activities uh, is extremely important for the, for the result of our project and the area of software processes is all about this, to, to, to find the best uh, way to, to organize activities for a given project, for, for a given set of, of uh, uh, people. So, uh, the uh, what's important here is, is first to figure out what software development is all about. What are the goals here? Well, goals vary. We don't have the same goals among all the stakeholders. Uh, so, so, for the uh, uh, vendor, uh, profit is important. For the developer, uh, typically uh, time is important. End user, it could be quality, training, services. So, so all stakeholders have different goals. And these goals, well, they tend to, to pull in different directions. One, uh, well, at least if you have a, a short-term view on things, uh, well, quality and profit. Quality is not for free comes at a cost. So uh, if the cost goes up, if we l strive for a better quality in our software, well we have some kind of tension that, that one of these goals are pulling in one, one direction and another goal pulls in a completely different direction. However, if we, if we take a long-term perspective on things and say that, okay, we're representing a software house now. We want to stay in business for quite some time. Well, we shouldn't try to trick our customers to, to, to pay up for, for a crappy product, should we? No. We should be a little bit more strategic in our, in our uh, activities. So, so what, are, what is it all about then? Well, We should strive for a maximum win situation, but not a single-sided win situation where just one of the stakeholders or a couple of the stakeholders feels like winners. We should strive for something where we have a win-win. And okay, it might sound a little bit, well, too idealistic here, but, but it's, if we want to stay in business, this is what we should look for. Because what is the, what is the ultimate, uh, 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 well, proof of, of good quality? That is that your customer returns. So, goals, we have many goals and we need to, 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 uh, to uh, come up with a way to, to reach this win-win situation. So. Last time we, we, we uh, talked a little bit about the different activities in a, in a development project. Uh, from planning to reflection in, an, in the middle, all these like productive activities where we uh, develop the, the artifacts, the different representations of our system as it's transformed from requirements into a, a deployable system at the end. So the principal challenge is to, to gain control over the system you're about to build and gain control of the system you're building. So understand your requirements and understand the system that you are constructing. And then we had these guys, remember? 
people, stakeholders, people involved in development in different ways. And here they come back, the, the, the uh, management, the customer, the developers, the different developers, different customers. And of course, they make a mess of our nice strategies and ideas because they are humans. And humans, they will, are not as easy to, to manage as a computer, for instance, because they have so many opinions about how things should be done, for instance, and they can change the, their mind from one day to the other. But we must try to at least gain control and keep it. And in order to do this, we, we need to approach this, this challenge of developing software in a, in a structured way, in a structured manner. Consider it as an engineering challenge. We're going to build a bridge. That bridge is, soft, is a piece of software, but it's that serious. It's not just a piece of software, it's a software system that should be engineered. What do we do? Well, we define process roles that we assign to these people. Not that we have like hats that we're giving out to the staff and to the other stakeholders, no, but it's like virtual behaviors that we assign to these. So we have a customer role, we have a developer role, we have an analyst role, etc. These roles perform or are involved in activities. So, so that gives us a better grip on what will happen when we develop the software. Because the activities and the roles, we can at least say, okay, you will be involved in these activities. At this point, we don't really know when, but at least we know who and when, or who and what, sorry. And then we have the work products, you remember, that was the inputs and outputs to the activities. That some role here, some role here was 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 responsible for. And that that gives us another what is a dimension. Now we know who's doing it, what they're doing it, uh, what they are doing, and also what is the result of their activities, and what is the information or whatever it is that they require before they can, 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 can perform this, this activity. So just adding some structure changes things dramatically. Because we need a process, that's, that's no, there's no doubt about it. We need a process, otherwise we will fail. Not all the time, but too often to be on an acceptable level. In industry, all forces must be aligned. That's fairly obvious. Someone is paying your salary, and it's not okay if you come up with your well, in your opinion, brilliant ideas and work in that direction while the rest of the department is working in a completely different direction. Then we end up with a similar problem as with the, uh, uh, the goals on the first slide. However, here we have someone who's decided that you should work in that direction. And a process is a way to, to uh, point out a direction and also to control Who's doing what? Because you can assign roles to individuals. In this way, we will end up with a process that is controllable. We can actually uh, trace what different individuals in our organization are doing or supposed to do. And to some extent, we can also monitor progress, because if we know who's responsible for something, we can go and talk to them, ask them. And this machinery, this structure, 
is defined on, on a level where we can actually apply it over and over and over again. So it will be repeatable. And since it's similar in structure, well, the results should also be similar in character. But a process is not a guarantee that you will succeed. Because there are so many uncertainties, and we will talk about these uncertainties next time, that influences the project. So you will never end up with a fail-safe project. The only thing you can do is that you can, you can do whatever, you can do whatever is, is possible to, to, to reduce the risk, the risks of failure. And a process model is one of these very powerful ways of reducing risks when it comes to software development. So we gain control and we can keep it with the process. So the software process may be considered as a roadmap to successful software development. However, remember what I said, there are no guarantees. You must do your job properly to, to, to uh, succeed. But it's the what, the when, the who, the how, and sometimes why. Because we all know, first time or when we are, don't have that much experience, we have questions. Experienced people have answers. Unexperienced people have questions. And a process model provides the answers to many of your questions. So it's a useful thing if you don't have experience because a process is actually some, some packaged knowledge. People have been developing software for 50, 60 years. So there is some experience around. And there are good ways and not so good ways to develop software. And these processes have encoded in the best practices, at least the best practices, well, for that particular time. So you find answers to your questions here. So you don't have to ask me. So now we gain control and we may keep it. But now back to this, this, this uh, critical question, and that is how do we organize work? Because this is something that has changed over time. It's like fashion. If you look eight years back, well, you start laughing. It's Something similar here. But how do we organize the roles? How do we organize the activities, the work products? Well, it depends. It depends on factors such as time, different dependencies, if we're dependent on external systems, if we're dependent on parallel development efforts, the competences we have in our uh, team, and the resources, time, money, all this and that. One factor is not here in this listing here. Which factor do you think is missing? Humans. Yeah, humans, sure. That's the resources. Sorry, I, I use like a concept for you guys and me. We're like a resource. The environment? Yeah, uh, environment could be it. Uh, that's, 
the environment is part of the, the problem. Because depending upon which type of software we develop, we have to do different things. Luckily, if say that you're developing a, a, a simple uh, game applet or a game app for for uh, 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 for for some for for some 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 cell phone, okay. Compare that to to some control software for a power plant. Do you think we can reuse the processes from one product to the other? No. In certain domains, for instance, this control software domain. Uh, Verification and validation are extremely important, of course, because this is what we talked about last time. When we have these cyber-physical systems, it's not the upset user, which is the most dramatic effect of a failure anymore. It could be fatal. It could be casualties if something goes wrong. So for such a system, activities. We have a machinery of activities around, well, coming up with assurances, evidence, guarantees that the system we are constructing is actually safe, secure, available. And this is completely different compared to what you see for your apps. They have other aspects that turns into activities that you don't see for the control software. So how you organize the work depends on these factors plus the problem. And that the problem includes also the environment. OK. So how do we organize work? Well, we have to remember one thing, and that is when we create a process model or when we pick a process model, when we, well, whatever we do here, we have the software development activities. And these are, these are like, th these are inherent. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot, well, bypass requirements. Or you cannot bypass implementation or, or uh, integration. You cannot do that because these guys are always there. So it doesn't matter if you, if you pick a process model from the 70s. Remember last time we had a look at the waterfall, stated that, OK, first we do some analysis, then we implement. Yeah. But you need some requirements to analyze, and you need a design to implement, and then probably you do some testing and integration. They are always there. So independently of which process model you pick, you have to figure these guys out. You need to master these. So process models come in many flavors. It's like ice cream or pizzas. If you Look here at the, the uh, y-axis is the sum of, of number of roles, number of activities, number of artifacts defined by, by this process model. There are a couple of, of process models that have almost no roles, no activities, no artifacts defined. Still used in the software industry. Kanban is one. Kalman has the, well, it comes from Japan, from the uh, automotive industry, efficient manufacturing, lean manufacturing. Now applied to software. Another one that maybe more, most of you have heard of, uh, Scrum. 
more roles, more activities, more artifacts than uh, Kanban. And then there are, well, some of the heavy process models, like the unified process that has, well, way, well, not way too many, but to, well, a really big number of roles, activities, and artifacts. So, the big difference between Kanban and the unified process is how much is prescribed. How much does the process model tell you what you should do? So, remember, you cannot bypass the activities on the previous slide. So, it doesn't matter if you do Kanban or the, the, some, some instance of the UP, you have to do all these activities. But the big difference, if you compare these models, or how much information will you get? And this is like, a, well, compare it to, to, to uh, cooking. Some people, they want a cookbook to follow. For some people, it's just good enough to, to, to have one of these uh, glossy uh, paper uh, cooking magazines and to get inspiration. Some guidance, not more. So many flavors, but we still have to do the job. So let's have a look at the process elements in Kanban. Uh, as I said before, lean production, minimize waste, uh, very effective production. Uh, in principle, there are no iterations. There is just an ongoing flow where you move uh, uh, activities, like, well, this is my, my, uh, one of my flows, and here you see some, some activities that goes from different states, from, from uh, well, a to-do, to coding, to review, to integration, and then they are done. No roles. So we have a question uh, here. Uh, what happens if we choose the wrong process models for our projects? Uh, I would say that, that uh, well, first, if you pick the, the wrong uh, process model uh, in certain domains, uh, well, they may have a huge negative impact on the, the product, the result. As the because it will will well bring down or take down the the uh, uh, skills in the team because they are just doing the wrong things. And then we should say that there are uh, the process model, the activities you do. Uh, most process models does not prescribe tools, methods, so design methods. If it should be object oriented or not, if it should be JavaScript or, or C Sharp or it should be that or this or that framework, no. But it's, it's more like if you say that you're exploring uh, unknown territory, you have not been in that domain before. Your, your organization is now branching out into a new domain. Uh, you should probably be a little bit more cautious and, and take time exploring alternatives and so on and so forth, instead of going for the, what I'll say, the first pick. So, so in a situation like that, uh, well, picking, well, doing the, using the same process as you did in your previous domain could be disastrous. I have another question in the room, yeah? Uh, all the models, they don't the requirements yeah. Uh, 
so the question was if, 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 if uh, selecting a different or different uh, process models would eventually have any impact on the final result. And I would say yes. Because uh, the focuses, the focus of, of these models are different. And we will see that. So, so uh, and also the overhead involved is, is huge in some of these. Whereas some models are very focused on creating value for customers. Some models are trying to be the generic process models model, which means that they are, well, requesting you to prepare documents that might not be needed for your particular domain. So yes, uh, there will be a huge difference in the, in the result. So what's important here is that, that you keep it visual. And, and if you go into to, to, uh, software houses today, you often see these uh, sticky note boards where, where they move around to-dos into to different states, and then you have a done column on the right-hand side. Uh, so Kanban is, is, is often combined. It's like a, a, well, a technique that you can use in, in, in uh, uh, together with other uh, processes. Here's a comparison. This is an excerpt from, from Unified Process. So, so what we have here is uh, the left column over on this side here is the uh, different roles. So we have different developer workers, for instance. We have architect, we have architect reviewer, we have capsule designer, code reviewer, database designer. Well, you see the number of roles compared to Kanban, where we had none. Uh, the same uh, comes then from the, the, uh, the column here, and these are uh, different artifacts. And then we have the, the contributes to, responsible for. That's the mapping in the middle, the C's and R's here. So this is a, well, completely different view on things. This is more geared towards large organizations, large systems, huge systems, I should say. Uh, typically systems for in domains where you have, well, more requirements in terms of, well, reliability, safety, etc. I don't say that this is the only process model that you may use in those two domains. I just say that it's, that's the intentions behind them. Then we have Scrum. Scrum is not in between. It's more uh, leaning to, 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 the, uh, to the Kanban side. Here we have a couple of roles, artifacts, and ceremonies, activities. But again, don't forget, we still have to do this. And these activities are much, much more important than the framework, the process model. Because if you have a nice, well-executed process model, and you fail in your analysis, the only good thing is that your pro process model probably includes some activities so that you will discover that. But still, there are no guarantees because you have to do the job. OK. So what should we do then? Well. Last time we, we saw some principles for how to organize the work. 
one of the strategies was was the one you saw from 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 Royce in the the waterfall model. Can I ask a question? Oh yeah. In which step is the process model now? Sorry. In which step is the process model now, or is it like all the steps? So so so, so what do you mean here? Yeah. So so the question was was really like, uh, in 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 which in which which step is the process model? And the question is, 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 is correct because, but the answer is it can be in any of these because as, as we will see now, depending upon how you organize these, they can appear in the beginning, in the beginning of the process. In the waterfall process, for instance, you do requirements first. You finish. Then you do your analysis and design. You finish, then you do your implementation. But in other process models, as we will see, these will be repeated over and over again. Like it's about how to structure a software project. And yeah. Like the different steps you go through yeah. when, you, when you do that. Yeah. And the process model is a one way. The process model is, is how you do it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the process model should include all of these yeah. steps. But it depends upon, well, some process models are very prescriptive. They tell you a lot how to do this, while others say, do it. Okay. Yeah. So if it's not prescriptive, I should follow these? No. Uh, no, I may, should like, go back to keep down that all these steps are included in the process model. Yeah, I should always see to that these steps are included. So how do you organize the, the, the work? We have milestones, as I said, where we had finished the requirements, finished the analysis and design, finished the implementation, finished the testing. That's one way to organize it. We have evolutionary. And evolutionary, you can, you can hear that this is something that, well, evolves over time. So you start with something and you let it evolve. And that means that you will do requirements, you will do analysis and design, and you will, be, uh, will implement and you will test in each of these. Iterative and incremental is a, uh, a variant of the evolutionary, so you do the same. Value-driven is also similar, but you can see that here we have different perspectives. The first one has a perspective on products developed by the, uh, well, project, inside the project, whereas the evolutionary, iterative, and incremental, and value-driven are more about how you organize what is the flow between these activities. Value-driven is the focus you have. You want to create value for the customer. So if you look at the OK, I'm not sure if it's a question. It's actually a better answer to the previous questions. Uh, uh, the seven uh, activities are what you do. And the process model is, is how you do the, how you, in which order you do them, and, 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 and so on. So evolutionary, exploratory, uh, system evolves as developers understand the problem. Because sometimes you don't know the problem. It can be difficult to specify the problem to a degree that you can actually follow a more traditional development process. One example that was around a couple of years ago was uh, if, you wanted to, if you want to develop real-time, well, translation tools. So, so translate speech, Swedish to English, Swedish to Japanese, whatever. Well, how do, you, how do you define the requirements there, the functional requirements? It's like translate. Uh, it, it's difficult to grasp. We haven't been there. It's unknown territory. So, so then we have 
the opportunity to do some exploration and, and, and we follow this uh, process down here that many people love uh, which is uh, uh, more or less you hack away and then you ask yourself if this is the system you want. If not, you go back and you, you redo. During the 1980s, people felt, well, we can't call this like, okay, we hack away and then we see if we're lucky or not. We have to call it something, so we call it prototyping. And, and from that has emerged an entire field of rapid application development, uh, tool supported. Uh, and you use this uh, for, for requirements verification or validation typically, where you, where you actually come up with a, 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 a prototype that you can demonstrate to your, your customers, because that is so much easier to talk about compared to an abstract document. So, milestones and, and, and evolutionary. Now we foc focus at, at bringing two principles together, and that's the iterative and incremental. So the challenge is we deal with complex systems, complex teams. We have a resource shortage, almost always. And there are additional constraints, like the environment. It can be uh, uh, some, some uh, uh, legal document, some, some direct, uh, uh, directive from the, uh, uh, from the EU, for instance, that, it, that restricts the way we can, how we, for how we can build or construct our systems. And uh, solutions. to this. Cycles. Don't try to solve the entire problem in one go. Solve it step by step. So add complexity bit by bit. So you solve some part of the problem, you add more to it afterwards. Cycles and piecewise addition will lead to shorter time frames. We don't have to think what we should do four weeks from now, tomorrow and Monday will be enough. We will reduce the problem sizes because we can focus on the most recent added, recently added piece. And we can not forget, but we can, we can push uh, parts of the problem to the future. And this will give us better control. Not full control, but it will give us better control. So, Cycles, shorter time frames, piecewise addition, reduce problem sizes, iterative and incremental. And what you see today is, is, is that all these process models, Kanban, Scrum, UP, they are iterative and incremental. So we have a question here. Uh, the evolutionary process seems to be good for developing continually better solutions. Uh, and, and, but it will be difficult to decide when you're finished. Uh, oh, yeah. But, but uh, the answer is, if, if, if you go in, into to the evolutionary process model and, and compare it to, to, to iterative and incremental, it's actually what we're doing. The only thing is that we have added more structure to it so we're not just concerned with uh, we're just not concerned with the requirements as for the evolutionary, uh, but we're in these we're more uh, concerned with the uh, 
uh, well, the entire uh, spectrum of activities, including the final product. So, uh, we, uh, repeat activities, we create mini projects, shorter time frames. That's what we get from the iteration. Piecewise addition, reduce problem sizes. That's what we get from increment. But the challenge now is, is, is of course, to, to uh, figure out how should we do this step-by-step uh, -step development. How can we be certain that we have actually started with the right pieces and not pushed the wrong parts of the problem in front of us? Sometimes it's not just enough to iterate because sometimes if you have made a decision, it will be difficult to reverse because you have invested lots of resources into that decision. But we will talk more about that in, 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 in uh, the uh, 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 lectures on, on software architecture, software design. So what are deciding your targets then? Well, drivers here. What, how do you, what do you choose your pieces? How do you uh, put your mini products together? Well, it depends on which drivers you have. Some projects look at time. You can say, okay, two weeks. We work for two weeks, not more not less. And this increment includes exactly what we can work with or produce in two weeks. Some use risks as a driver. They do some assessment and try to figure out, okay, what are the most risky decisions at hand? And we try to focus on those first. Some look at values, values for themselves and value for the customer. But what we will see is that, that these uh, Drivers are often combined. So we have risks, we have time, we have value for customers, and that is combined when we make our decisions for what to include in an iteration. What should be the focus of this work? What should be the increment? So, shortly we will have a break, but just for you guys to, to get a feeling that, that for what iterative models and iterative and incremental models mean. Well, this is the, the spiral model. Uh, it's a process model which is generic, but, but you f have found it mostly uh, used in, in, in uh, well, software products. Uh, there is a, uh, an incremental axis, uh, which is uh, the, uh, this axis here, the x-axis. You can see that there is an increment here, so e each iteration will add to the application. There is also a cost aspect. 
you can see that the cost here. But that's not, well, what we should focus on. We should focus on, on, on the four quadrants here. And what you can see is that, that when you start your spiral here, you first determine what, is the, what are the goals, what are the objectives for this iteration. When you've done that, you can start looking for alternatives. What alternatives do I have at hand to, to achieve the goals, to achieve the objectives for this iteration? And then you have constraints. Could be time, could be resources, could be technical constraints, etc. Then you evaluate the alternatives. You identify and resolve risks connected to the different alternatives. Down here, you develop the alternatives or the alternative you picked. You verify. And then, down here, you can plan for the next phase, the next iteration. So, Iterative means that you figure out your objectives, evaluate your alternatives, select among the alternatives, execute the alternatives, and then you plan for the next phase. This is the, the basis for all iterative, and I would say also iterative and incremental processes, this way of working. So guys, it's, it's time for a break, 10 minute break. So, okay, let's continue with the, the spiral model and, and uh, go into the, the first uh, quadrant here. Uh, specify the goals for this part of the system or project and identify alternative paths to reach the specified goals. Engineering practices at work. A goal, alternative paths to achieve the goal, and then figure out which restrictions you have. Okay, now we're off for a good start. And we may continue to, to, to the second. And now it's, it's starting to, to, to analyze these alternatives we identified under the, the constraints. And, and what we should strive for here is, is risk. And as you, as you saw uh, last time, and we'll see, well, I will talk more about risks next, next uh, time, is, is that Risks are not just that people get sick, that we run out of money, that someone is changing the, the, the uh, uh, rules for, for uh, uh, marketing on the internet or something like that. Risks are, are so many different things. And, and we take them into account when we, we uh, select among the alternatives. This analysis will also be the basis for, for, for uh, uh, a risk assessment where we come up with, with plans for how to, to deal with risks if they uh, will happen. So, so uh, the uh, third quadrant will then be very straightforward. We have selected among the alternatives and now it's just about carrying them out. What I say now is, of course, simplifications, because carrying them out can be, well, requirements, it can be implementation, it can be, eval well, many of the complex activities that, that we will go through uh, in the remaining uh, lectures. Evaluate. Did you achieve your objectives? Sometimes the answer is a big yes, sometimes it is not that big yes, sometimes it's a no, and sometimes it's, it's a no. And this must be reused, or you take that as feedback into 
the next fourth and final quadrant. Because it's not just always the case that you add and add and add and add. Sometimes you make mistakes. You make the wrong decisions. You select not the best alternative, but since you are in an iterative process, you will come back quickly, rather quickly, to the decision point where you say, was this good or not? You will not go on for months before you discover this. OK, so now we're uh, back on iterations, the mini project. And we pick the activities, we pick the roles, we pick the artifacts for this mini project from the regular set of process elements. Each iteration generates an increment. So what is an increment? Well, an increment can be something that is an internal release. It can be a document, it can be a piece of code, it can be a class, it can be a, a design document, it can be an executable. It can be test cases. But the sum of all these contributions made by this iteration, that's the increment. Because it's one step towards the final product. And as I said, sometimes one step, next iteration, one step back. Because it was not the right step. OK, so a small example. Here we have the plan, the requirements, all the activities until uh, uh, the reflection step there. Now we're going to develop an application that transfers files from A to B. OK, from an incremental perspective, we can say that Transferring files from A to B is too much for us. My intellectual capacity is so restricted that I can't do this. I have to do this in two increments, two steps. So increment one plus increment two, that will be our solution. OK? So uh, the first increment data transfer, we focus on just transferring data from A to B. Doesn't matter the type of data, it's just data. And then we have file management in our second increment. So what we've done now is that we have divided this into two chunks. And we ordered, we ordered the, the two chunks. And I would say that data transfer is more critical than file management for this application. Because if we don't get file management, or sorry, if we don't get data transfer, file management is, is anyway useless if we want to achieve the goals for, these, for this application. So focus on the critical one the risky one. So we focus on data transfer first. OK, now we have an increment. However, we can further def divide this increment at this level up into iterations. So the uh, data transfer increment over at this end can be divided up into two further increments. First, establish a data connection. Then, transfer data. And now, we say, OK, this increment can actually be before or achieved by an, in an iteration. You see? 
So we think that requirements analysis and implementation analysis and design implementation and testing well we can actually go through that and establish a data connection then we restart in iteration 2 transferring the data that means that we have finished the first increment so this is what you do you de you decompose the problem you see into, into, into chunks that you can actually deal with. And we do the same for the, for the second increment, which is file management and then file transfer eventually. So uh, what's important here is that you uh, <coughs> recognize the fact that in this case, the iteration produces something that is executable. However, it's not feature complete. So it's something that we can run, but it's not complete in terms of, well, the functional goals for the application. So just ask yourself, well, how do you work when you develop software? If you have an assignment from, a, from a, a, a programming class, at least in the fourth and final or fifth and final assignment, the, the, the task is often so big that you cannot have a go at the entire problem in one step. So you do this. You say, OK, I start with this first, and then I do this. And at the end, I add the, these features. You do that. But what we do with the process model is actually that we have someone telling us that you should do this. Because now you're not on your own. You have all your colleagues. And you must figure out what is the way, best way to decompose and allocate resources to these increments, to these iterations. OK. So now we go from, yeah, we have a question? Yeah, but what I, so the question was about, well, what is the relationship between increment and iteration? What you can say is that each iteration always provides an increment. But sometimes you define an increment that can, it requires several iterations. So, so, so I, will, I will illustrate that, exactly that uh, uh, in two slides from now. So here we have the open UP, which is a uh, not so, uh, uh, it's an well, open unified process. So it's, it's available, you can, uh, on, 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 on the net for free, you can go there, you can browse the, 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 the pages, and you can learn a lot about how a project is organized. OpenUP is a configurable process, which means that you can pick and choose which roles, which activities, which work products you want to work with. So you can use OpenUP to, to define, well, Scrum, if you want to. So here we have iterations and increments in different, along different dimensions. Uh, at the bottom here, uh, we have the, uh, the product life cycle. The product life cycle has a perspective of months. So what they say is that typically you have a long product going for months. 
possibly spanning a year or two. However, we all know that, that trying to figure out what we should do a year from now or two months from now, that's kind of challenging. So what we do is that we, instead of trying to, to come up with a detailed plan, we look at the system we have at hand and we start <coughs> dividing the effort up into more chewable pieces and we say that the first increment here is something we call the inception phase. Inception is when we focus on establishing a project. When we have a project, that is that we have understood some of the basic requirements, we have set up a product environment, etc., we can continue in to the second phase, which is an elaboration phase. No more details about what we should do in this increment than that we should, at the end of the increment, have an executable system, a system that focuses on the core functionality, almost like the data transfer in the previous example. When we have that, you can see that we have reduced the risks considerably. We know how to transfer data. So we may continue and start adding value. So here you can see four increments, the faces of this project. Okay? However, still, the perspective of months is way too long if we consider tens or hundreds of people involved in a project. We need to, well, break it down into to smaller pieces if we want to in a, use the resources we have at hand in an efficient way. So, then we have the second way of decomposing, the iteration. And the iteration has a perspective of weeks. And we all know that if we talk about weeks, you can be pretty certain about what you would like to do in a couple of weeks. And if you have a problem at hand, it can be fairly straightforward to figure out what you should do at least a week and a half from now. So we shorted the time frames. We reduced the problem because each of these iterations has a focus. And that is within weeks deliver an executable demonstrator. However, we have all the people involved. And now we talk about days. What should you do when you get to work today? What should you do when you get to work tomorrow? So we decompose the big task of data transfer into phases, into where each phase is further divided into iterations. And in each iteration, we define work items. And work items are, well, tasks that belong to these activities, like you should design this C-sharp class. You should uh, develop a mock-up of the user interface. And here we have a completely different focus because on the product life cycle, well, we talk about all the stakeholders. Developers, customers, everyone here is part of the product life cycle. However, that's not the way to get 
gain control over your developers or your, your staff. What do we do? Remember from last time when we talked about how to reduce complexity? We create abstractions. We create groups. So each group will now be responsible for something. And we can have groups working on the same iteration, or we can have groups working on different iterations, depending upon the size of the project, of course. And each team, or this, these three teams, will then be responsible for, within a week or a couple of weeks, come up with a shippable build, or something that we can at least demonstrate. So you see that, well, on this level, long perspective. Here, shorter perspective. And then at the top level, when we talk about days, when we talk about the individuals, well, it's very well-defined, described work items. Go and do this. You should be able to finish this within days, not weeks days. So a question, uh, what is the difference between uh, sprints in Scrum? We will come to that shortly. Uh, well, uh, sprints are uh, iterations. That's the answer. Uh, the, 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 the difference uh, or where you can see differences are in how you define the increment for an iteration. So Scrum prescribes how you should define the increment. You should define a sprint backlog, come back to that. But UP, open UP, I said, was, was more open. Here you can do it in different ways. But you can say, OK, select among the, uh, the user stories we have and define a, scrum back, uh, uh, a sprint backlog. So the OpenUP faces then, uh, inception, get the product off the ground. So then when we have a product, we can start to analyze the requirements, try to get the first executable up and running that focuses on the core functionality. Then we start adding features or value. And at the end of the construction phase, we have a complete system. No more features. Instead, we spend time during transition to correcting bugs, improving system performance, uh, adopting it, adapting it for, for customer-specific requirements, etc. So, launch the project, focuses on the customer, the product itself, and assess risks. Then, risk reduction, and we do that by developing this architecture that can run, it's an executable baseline. Now we have something that is stable. We have solved the most risky problems. So we can go on and add value to the for the customer. We can add features on top of the architecture. At the end, we say, OK, let's not include more features in this release. Instead, find and correct defects, perform beta tests. At the end, you have an acceptance test, if you, depending upon which product type of product you have. And then you have a system release. Question? Yes? Uh, it seems that this mode is imposing financial unnecessary. Uh, you mean? Uh, but what you have here is, is you have iterate. So the question, well, is this really iterative? Uh, is it, isn't it just incremental? But no, but 
here you, it's they are they come together as a package each iteration provide, develops an increment so you cannot well uh, if you're iterative uh, I must be sure about this but it, I, I would say that it's in fact impossible not to be incremental <laughs> otherwise you will do the same thing over and over and over again in each iteration Yes, and not, this is a slide where I'm going to explain that question okay. or answer that question. So increments, sometimes one or more iterations, yes. So here we have, we're back on, on this, this, this little example here where we have the data transfer. And we decided, okay, data transfer is risky. If we don't succeed with the data transfer, the product will fail we will not have customers that feel like winners. So, what do we do? We define our first increment. And this is what should be part of the elaboration here. You see? Data transfer is important because it's at the very core of the application. However, we set the goal, after setting the goals for, for the elaboration phase, we realized that, okay, for this, we need at least two iterations. And we can set the goals for iteration one to establish a data connection. And we can set the goals for iteration two to transfer data. So we will look more into this next time. But when you talk about this type of planning, decide what goes into an increment, what goes into an uh, iteration, this is not something that you do up front in the beginning of the project. This is something that you do continuously. Remember, we start with planning. Each planning, requirements, analysis, design, analysis and design, implementation, and testing, and reflection. Reflection was part of this evaluation. Did we achieve the goals? Do we need to throw something more into the next iteration? What should go into the next iteration? So. It can be the case that we have some kind of rough planning where we have some idea about, well, what goes into the iterations, but then these plans are refined over time as the project progresses. So now we have, uh, after elaboration, a system that, that, that runs and it can transfer data from A to B, whatever that is. But there is no real value to customers because customers, they were asking for file transfer. But now we have solved the risky problems. So now we can go in and start creating value for customers. And we do that in the second increment. And that second increment is actually defined by the construction phase. And in this construction phase, we have two iterations, one that deals with file management and one that actually realizes the file transfer. Okay, and now we're moving on from the unified process into uh, agile processes. And, and uh, plan-driven or agile, well, what is hot and what is not? Um, recent years, being agile, there's a trend towards uh, uh, including more and more 
things you should do in agile processes. So maybe in a couple of years, what we'll end up with is something that was very similar to what we had a couple of years ago. Who knows? The only thing we know is that software industry tends to be cyclic. Every now and then, something pops up as to the uh, uh, silver bullet that will solve all problems at hand. And then, well, a couple of years ago, it was object orientation. Then it was uh, 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 service-oriented programming. The only thing we can see is that new technology brings in more complexity. And this complexity is a constantly moving target. So let's focus on these guys. Scrum, uh, more uh, specifically. What's, what's they are kind of interesting because they, they, they at, well, at least Scrum, because it's the result of a, a reaction among uh, developers that felt that processes just became too much of a, a burden. It, you shifted the focus from what was important for the customer stakeholder to what was important for the management stakeholder. So the target for, for, for agile processes is to put value for customer into focus. Minimum viable product. This is something that we should strive for. Minimum viable product. That is the product composed of only the most necessary features. Only the ones that brings real value to the customer. You know, if you, if, you, if, you, if you purchase software, well, probably you don't do that too often, but, but if, you, if you purchase a thing, and this thing has 100 features, however, on a daily basis, you only use eight. And now, every now and then, you use an additional two. You paid for 90 features that you never use. There are numbers that, that for some of the office packages that, that people use, uh, we tend to use less than 10% of the functionality. But we pay f for 100. And, and Minimum viable product is trying to shift the focus to saying, stating that you should only deliver to your customers what they want and what they need. Not more, not less. And this is because this has a background in, in, in lean development, minimizing waste. What is waste? Unnecessary work. Unnecessary work costs money that someone has to pay for. And waste is no value. Even if they get a feature for it, it's waste because they pay for something they don't use. I said that this was like, came up as a reaction from, from developers. And, and they wrote down a manifesto. And this is a, a, a carbon copy of text from, from, from uh, agilemanifesto.org that you can go in and, 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 and read. Uh, Individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Here you can see that, OK, it's more important that we communicate within a project than to have a, a rock solid uh, tool suite supporting a detailed, extremely detailed, defined process. Working software is much more important than comprehensive documentation. 
customer collaboration is more important than contract negotiation. And responding to change is much more important than following a plan. They also state this. There is value to the things on the right. However, they value the items on the left more. So this manifesto has then been uh, translated into to, to some principles or rules or whatever you choose to call them. Our highest priority is to satisfy the customer. And how do you satisfy customers? Well, you serve them with the software they are asking for. And you can keep them happy if you continuously deliver working software to them so that they can see progress, so that they don't have to sit on their offices waiting for months knowing nothing about what's going on in the secret software house. Welcome change. Well, what you see in, 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 in uh, if you talk to, to people in industry is that, okay, well, the problem is the customer because they change their minds all the time. And you know, if they change their minds, we have to redo things. But here, even late in development, because change, there is a reason for change. And we want to make our customers happy, so if we don't deliver the software they want, they will not be happy. And if they want to change something, we change it. Deliver working software frequently. Preference to the shorter uh, time scale. This is important because it will give us instant feedback. It's extremely difficult to say anything about software if you read a document. At least if you compare to using that software. If you install software, have a user using it, you will get useful in information, feedback, that you can take into your iterations, into your next increments. A way to achieve this is, is to, to involve business people and developers, that we have them on site working together on a daily basis. Not just at the beginning of a product, throughout the product. The final principle here, build products around motivated individuals. What they say is that we don't need a process if we pick motivated individuals and give them an environment where they can work because software engineering, software development is fun. Solve problems is fun. And if we give people an environment where they can solve problems developing software, and have fun, they will deliver. So you should like protect them from external disturbances so they can focus on delivering value to the customer. So we have a question here uh, about uh, uh, if, if you can have agile processes in, in big organizations. I, I said last time that yes, a, a large enterprise like IKEA can have agile processes going, not everywhere, but somewhere. Uh, that means that, well, responding to change, agile is not the only answer. But, but uh, at some point, it will be, be uh, uh, more difficult to, to, to have a, uh, an agile uh, process running. So, so uh, 
I shouldn't say that, that it's not applicable at all, at all levels, but I would say that it's better to, because a large organization, it's difficult to find the motivated individuals in all offices. So we will, the question, a second question is how, how we decide the minimum increment. Uh, we will uh, look at that at, at uh, one of the last slides today. So I come back to that. So here we have some principles continuing. Uh, working software is the primary measure of progress, not a document, not a meeting. Working software. Simplicity is a principle. The art of maximizing the amount of work not done maximizing the amount of work not done. Don't over-design. Don't spend too much time in finding the most beautiful solution in all situations. Simplicity. Keep it simple. That's a very good engineering principle. At regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective, then tunes and adjusts. So it's not just about delivering software, it's also about growing as a team, becoming better and better at what we're doing. So what does this look like then? Yeah, agile has been, well, there are many different uh, process models uh, that, that claim to be agile. One of the first, uh, well, part of this initial agile manifesto movement, well, as a result, extreme programming surfaced, XP. And, and here you see some of these uh, 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 principles transformed into activities transformed into to, to, uh, artifacts. Uh, one is, is uh, uh, small releases, for instance, down here. Um, another one is, is, well, of course, the iterative one. One is the uh, user stories up here. And, and the fact that you, from a set of user stories, pick a few that goes into your uh, release that you develop in iterations. So besides this, this uh, process model, uh, the extreme programming uh, community came up with a couple of, of programming principles or engineering principles. Uh, there are some, I think, 12 agile methods or practices that 40 hour work week. Sounds good. That's a principle. You should not have burnouts in your team. It shouldn't be, well, sleeping bags in the office three days before delivery. No, no. Remember, Provide an environment, a sustainable environment where people have fun. Okay, a stay over in a sleeping bag might be fun, but if you're like in the second week together with 15 others in the same room, it's not that fun anymore. Pair programming. Okay, how do you avoid documents? Share knowledge. Have people working together. Continuous integration. Continuous delivery. Customer on site. Well, if you want short, quick feedback loops, find answers to your questions about clarifications for user story, prioritization, stuff like that. 
have your customer on site, or at least someone who's representing the customer. All these engineering uh, practices are then organized as planning, planning, managing, designing, coding, and testing. And as you will see uh, next time, for planning and so on, there are many things that are shared among uh, uh, XP and, for instance, uh, Scrum. So pair programming is one. We have a driver and we have a navigator. What's important here is that we achieve something that is extremely important. They collaborate and they communicate. We don't need to document because if one guy is gone, the other one is around and she or he has answers to questions, can take on a task or something. Continuous integration, to integrate often. Continuous integration forces you to have smaller pieces, smaller increments. Otherwise, it will be difficult to integrate often. You see as that, a principle that forces you as a group to do something that you want to achieve. So let's look at Scrum, an agile process, first mentioned in 96. The key here is the self-organizing team and organization into sprints. You have a product backlog, and it doesn't prescribe any, any techniques or methods, really. It looks like this, not too far from XP. XP is a little bit more detailed, but, but it's more about how you visualize the processes. What's interesting here is that, that you have, uh, over at this end, you have the planning that we will uh, talk more about next time. Then we have uh, the communication, which is managed uh, primarily in a daily scrum meeting, uh, where you have a very short meeting with the development team where you talk about issues and, and uh, targets for the day, etc. Then a sprint that goes on for some time, and at the end you have some delivery. Then there are some extras that we will look at next time for, for planning and, and, and reflecting together with the customer. Isn't that sprint kind of like an iteration? It is an iteration, yeah. yeah. So everything that is cyclic in development, you can call it an iteration, okay? So the principle here is that no changes during a sprint. You define your sprint backlog and there should be no change. A sprint should continue until it's impossible to keep change requests away. And this is, again, creating an environment where people can focus on solving the problems they have at hand. But still, two weeks, three, four weeks, that's still a rather restricted time frame. So we can still respond to change in time to keep the customers happy. Cross-functional development teams. Well, it used to be experts. I'm the testing guy, I'm the requirements guy. I put on this hat and I don't take it off until the product is over. However, if you have a self-organizing team, you don't know, know from day to day if you should focus on testing or if it's development. So you need something that looks like this. Cross-functionality. You should not be an expert. You should be like a jack of all trades. That's also funnier, more interesting, more challenging than to be a programmer, just. So we look at the roles. We have a product owner. We will come back to all these when we talk about planning. Uh, artifacts and the ceremonies. Product backlog is where the, the customer sets the goals for the product, product. A list of all desired work on the product. And that can be user stories that corresponds to, to behavior that we would like to see in the system, to uh, more uh, techno technologica techno uh, technologically oriented tasks. We plan these in two steps. 
So in each sprint, we will take on a certain number of stories from the backlog. Participants in this step is the product owner, that's the customer representative, the scrum master, and the development team. Second step, that is after, and now it's interesting because it's the team that decides what goes into the sprint backlog. So the, uh, the team says, we can do this, not more, during the sprint. Then, in the second step, the development team internally plans the sprint. Okay, so that will give us something that looks like this. Product backlog, we pick a couple of user stories into a sprint backlog and then we plan how to achieve these stories or goals for, for this sprint. So, today's takeaways. Process models are shades of gray. You do the same things eventually. You do requirements, you do analysis, implementation, testing, etc. Some models tell you more than others. We have Kanban, we have Scrum, we have OpenUP. What we can see is that Agile requires a different skill set and experience because it, there are assumptions cross-functional teams, for instance. Next lecture, we will see, okay, with all these uh, models, how do we do planning? How do we set up a project? How do we manage a project using these different process models. Okay, so that was it for today. Uh, so just to come back to John Key's questions, how do you decide a minimum increment? Well, in, in Scrum, that's the first step in the planning uh, where you discuss with the product, product manager what is most important, what is prioritized, but still the team that decides what goes into the product backlog. The, the sprint backlog, sorry. Okay, thank you, and see you next week.